greetings thanks for joining me today hope you can hear me all right i uh i have a helmet on and as you can see it's uh it is beautiful out here Right after a snowfall and everything's flocked with 
now. basically straight ahead off to the left. I'm uh, north of Church Road, Selden. Those locals will know exactly what I'm talking about. And again, I'm not trying to make anyone motion sick by turning my head a lot, but I'm keeping an eye out for the moose. I figured it'd be a little better vantage point than just mounted on this. This, this is the kind of area uh, that the uh, encounter I'm going to share takes place in. You got a mix of, you know, pine, spruce, hardwood, birch, a few cottonwoods in there, not a whole lot, but a uh, similar train. The encounter comes from uh, Joe and Carl about 30 years ago now. They tried their hand at uh, fur trapping and I'll get into that here in a little bit here's the road this uh, this goes right on up to church and that way is Pittman and uh, like I said Hatchet Pass would be further that way engine brakes on these things are crazy good like a little too good 
in the mud it'll make you start kicking sideways if you're not giving it at least a little gas which seems uh, counterintuitive going down a steep hill the road so I'm gonna end this recording and uh, hopefully the sound sounds good if it does you'll know because there won't be a voiceover but if there's a voiceover then you'll know the sound didn't record very good just beautiful anyway we'll catch you guys here shortly hey thanks for joining me today Fred Alaska of course uh, like uh, Part of that little intro ride around in the snow uh, mentioned Joe and Carl, uh, not their real names. They attempted to do some uh, trapping to make money, trapping for furs. And so it was about 30 years ago. And where they were, um, we'll say the interior. Uh, so Joe's good friend has a home he lives in year round. And he's a snowbird so he would leave for the winter so joe years back you know talked to him about use of his house while he's gone being a snowbird to do trapping over the winter him and his buddy carl and his friend was like sure you know i'll even you know instead of because the guy would normally get rid of everything in his cupboards and all that you know it just keep you know canned goods in the pantry or whatever he said i'll leave everything as is you just take care of the house uh, you'd be responsible for the electric bill etc while I'm gone and you know call it good no rent no nothing you guys you know make a go of it or whatever and <laughs> where this guy's house was was approximately six miles from where their trap line would start and it was about uh, from what he was saying they, they bit off a little more than they could chew but it was roughly a 30 mile teardrop shaped area right where you go up one valley, circle through another one, and come back another valley. Very <laughs> ambitious, especially for novice trappers. Uh, they knew nothing about setting traps for Martin. They had to go and school themselves, talk to some other trappers, you know, all that kind of stuff. So they get into it, and they're about a month in, and they're it's kind of hit and miss. You know, they're, they're the learning curve on, you know, proper baiting and proper set, and, you know, all this stuff you know they're they're going through the motions for the first month it was you know hit and miss and they were having some success which was allowing them to continue and feel comfortable continuing and so about a month in he said uh him and carl they were using uh this little skidoo tundra right it's like a 340 or 440 cc little workhorse snow machine and what Carl would do is leave before Joe and go and run the trail if it had snowed to make sure it was packed and whatnot. And what they would do at the beginning of that teardrop is Joe would get off on foot and start walking one way with a duffel bag and, you know, some other stuff to re rebait traps and reset them. And Carl would start on the snow machine to wrap around and they would meet somewhere along the way. Now, Joe at the time was a little heavier set and he was trying to lose weight. And so his idea, you know, hey, there's no bears out to worry about, just moose. So he, you know, he had a pistol for protection from moose and a small caliber rifle, basically a, a 1022, um, for any animal still alive in the trap if he happened to come across them. <laughs> so Carl drops him off this day. Now, Carl is a lot taller than Joe and used to wear this one piece, huge black snowsuit, right? And wore a black helmet and black face mask so he looked like a big black figure you know in the peripheral uh i believe he said carl was six foot four so he's used to seeing tall black dark figure carl is what he was assuming so just keep that in mind because it, it comes in it becomes relevant here shortly so about a month in there joe gets dropped off Carl takes off to go and check the sets on this side with the snow machine and the little sled and Joe starts on foot and so as he's going along so my last video everybody's like 
She's so pretty, you know, why did why did she sit? Sorry about that. Stupid phone. So Carl takes off. Joe's on foot. He makes it, he said, probably to the fifth set. And he wasn't here in the snow machine, so he knew Carl wasn't close yet, but as he was going along on the on the fifth set he was checking they happened to have caught in a little a little martin and he got it out of the trap it was frozen he threw it in the duffel bag reset it and was doing his thing and out of his peripheral he notices a big dark figure way off in the distance and figured oh well carl must have already made it around and stopped the snow machine and went on foot to check some stuff himself that's why i'm not hearing the snow machine but that that's carl over there right <laughs> so he continues on and there's you know they don't have a whole lot of sets out they just you know they they were novices they you know they were just kind of spitballing it as they went along well joe said once he got past not the the following trap but the one after he notices this dark figure again out of the peripheral and looks and all at the distance you know it was a few hundred yards all he could see was this dark figure going in and out of the tree line on the opposite side of the little valley there and he's trying to he's trying to figure out where what is Carl doing you know okay let me let me continue what I'm doing I'm gonna go meet up with him make sure he's okay I don't want him to get lost that's my buddy and, and whatnot right so he goes on he does a couple things he has to do and he knows it's you know a good quarter mile or better to the next trap so he kind of trots along gets back on the pack snow machine trail for easier traveling because trust me you get out in this stuff it, it, you you sink you know even with snowshoes it's not guaranteed that it's easy travel at all so he's going along and he starts calling out hey carl hey carl hey 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 and this figure stops and it's a couple hundred yards away and he's like hey what are you doing get on the trail you know i don't want you getting lost in the woods this thing just he figures carl ignored him and then went off into the trees and he's, what the hell so now he's concerned so trapping gets set to the side and Joe's walking down this packed snow machine path towards the direction where he saw his buddy Carl go off into the trees. So he's sitting there going, hey, hey, hey. He's yelling and yelling. He's like, what are you doing, dude? Get, get out of the trees. Are you okay? What happened? You know, don't make me follow you in there. I don't I don't want to have to drag you out. You know, you're, you're a big guy. You know, come back out. Nothing, nothing. And he hears off in the distance the, the little tundra too. He's like, wait a minute. So he it, it kind of throws him off. So he backs away from what he was doing, gets back onto the snow machine trail, and just kind of stands there. A little while later, Carl comes around the bend, sees him, and he starts waving him down. He snow machines over to him, and he's like, "What were you, what were you doing over there?" And Carl's just dumbfounded. He's like, "What what are you talking about, dude? Are you drinking? You know?" And so he tells him what he saw, whatever. And Carl just kind of laughs and was like, "You probably saw a rear end of a moose, and it wandered off." Joe's telling Carl, no, I thought I saw you in the one piece black snowsuit on two feet walking away. And he goes, well, moose can look like a, you know, a person from behind. It has a certain silhouette, blah, blah. So they had that little debate and let it go. Uh, nothing was really happening. They had uh, a couple other little small fur bearing animals and they just called it a day. He jumped in the sled. They went back. About another week later, they did the same thing. Uh, during that week they would off and on take turns checking it and whatnot and so again they went out on doubles and Joe got off the same place again at the bottom of the teardrop and started the same same routine uh, nothing happening in the traps nothing going on it, it was it was pretty quiet and as he's going along he's kind of staring down at his feet just kind of kicking around or whatever just kind of like man I, I really hope this picks up you know they have high hopes for this you know making you know money in the fur trade and so <laughs> as he's kicking along joe said when he was staring at his feet he got this feeling he was being watched and so he stops and he starts looking around doesn't notice anything and so as he's kind of looking around getting trying to shake this eerie feeling he starts feeling spooked spooked so much that he takes the 22 off his shoulder and makes sure he's got a round in it, it just to hold something he didn't want to draw the pistol out or whatever because he had big gloves on and in order to do that he'd have to you know take the glove off and it was cold and whatnot so just holding the rifle he felt a little better 
uh, of course he couldn't he would have to take the glove off as well for the rifle for the finger guard because the gloves were too big but anyway it was just more peace of mind and a visual for whatever he was feeling looking at him and so he stands there and he's watching for a while and he just can't shake this feeling he starts feeling spooked like he wants to go the other way but he knows he has to continue going this way to meet up with carl otherwise it's a long walk by himself the other way and he doesn't know how long carl's going to be and so he keeps walking and he just kind of every few steps he's looking around side to side and off to his right hand side is the thickest brush you got hardwoods you got the the spruce black spruce and, and some you know pine trees and whatnot uh and again you know the, he said there was a few cottonwoods in there but they there were just small patches here and there right so after going about he said 100 yards of just getting overwhelmingly creeped out he, he said he couldn't shake it and so he took his glove off and started screaming hey i'm here and then shoots once in the air with this 22 just just to make noise he, he needed because it was so quiet and he needed to break this mental like fear that was gripping him and he figured a gunshot would just kind of reinvigorate his confidence you know I, i'm armed and whatever's out here is just you know they, they'll know i'm armed so he, you know he squeezed off that round and a moment later as he's trying to get the glove back on and not drop the rifle in the snow uh he gets screamed at from further up this valley before the turn right and because this is a big teardrop shape okay so he gets screamed at and he's trying to figure out what the hell just made that noise because uh from what joe said as he was wiggling on and, and kind of bear hugging the rifle at the same time trying to get that glove on he could feel the scream like shaking his body and he said he guesstimated it had to be at least 300 yards away now that's a lot of force to you know be feeling the effects of it at that distance um he said it was so weird it felt like it was directed at him uh he said it, and it lasted 20 25 seconds is his guesstimation that's not approximate it's just guessing because it was just sustained and so it got to a point where he kind of turned away because it was just uncomfortable and he noticed movement off to his left when he, he turned away and then came back he noticed movement but as soon as he looked there was no movement so I was like what the hell well luckily Carl around the corner a ways quite a ways heard that same scream just reverberate back around to him and when he heard that he didn't know what the hell it was he assumed it was Joe somehow screaming god awful needing help and fired up the snow machine and came around now Carl is still at a good distance from him. He can hear the snow machine and see it way off in the distance come around that corner. Now you gotta remember, this is like a damn near 30 mile teardrop, right? So just around the corner is a few miles. So as he's sitting there watching Carl come around the corner on the snow machine and stuff, he notices movement again out of his peripheral and he looks real quick and the movement stops, but he notices snow sloughing off the trees and was like, Oh, well something's over there so his attention's over here and you hear the scream again uh it, he said the second scream was more like a bark real short uh less than 10 minutes long but it, it he said it sounded like a bark compared to the long drawn out scream so it's all relevant right and so it being shorter and a little more lower tone lower pitch it wasn't as high pitched as the first scream uh he said it, it sounded more angry right and again they don't they don't know what the hell's going on at this point it's just weird noises weird movements weird figures it, it, it's just weirdness right high strangeness so he focuses back over to where he saw the movement and he notices this dark figure about 70 yards away just right inside that opposite tree line kind of kind of doing uphill a little bit come downhill go uphill a little bit come downhill and it, it's moving at a pretty good clip so he's watching it in between the trees as it's going along he's like what the hell is that and again carl still got a good distance that he's coming around to find joe and so joe said as he was standing there he unbeknownst didn't even realize after he heard that second yell he had 
just subconsciously had the glove off and drew out his pistol, which was a little snub nose 44. He had that out and he didn't even realize he had grabbed it out until his hand was getting cold, right? Because at this point it's like 10 below. And so, he, you know, it dawns on him. He's like, oh, he reholsters, puts his glove back on and is just in this mind fog of what's what's going on here. You know, I'm getting this weird scream. There's movement over here. And a few moments later, Carl gets there, right? And after Carl gets there, he was like, "Why? what are you screaming for? And he goes, that wasn't me. And so they, you know, he had turned off the snow machine and Joe was like, just, just fire it up. Let's, let's just get out of here. There's something moving over here and something screamed down over there. Carl's like, yeah, that's why I came. And Carl's curious. Carl's looking around him, you know, like what's going on here, Joe, you know, is this a prank or something? And he could tell by Joe's body language, Joe wasn't playing, but Carl was trying to see what Joe saw, like trying to put eyes on this thing to determine what was really happening. Well, According to what Joe said, Carl happened to look off because it would be Carl's right and it was Joe's left when that figure was moving up and down the hill. Carl turned and happened to have seen something. And when he saw it, uh, he had the kill switch down, but he's sitting there pulling on this thing, looking over off to his right, pulling, pulling, and, and then he stops and he points over and he goes, this, and then he notices the kill switch pops it up, fires it up. And he's pointing, he's pointing, getting Joe's attention, pointing off to his right. He's like, it's over there, it's over there. And then knocks Joe out of the sled because Joe was standing up in the sled trying to look what he was doing before he sat down. Well, Carl guns it and Joe basically tumbles out of the sled and Carl takes off. And immediately Joe starts screaming, hey, hey, hey. Carl hears it. He's about <laughs> damn near 50 yards away at this point and Joe's trying to catch up. Well. Carl's looking back, telling him, hurry, 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 unbeknownst to Joe, off to Joe's right-hand side as he's catching up to this sled. This thing came out of the woods a little ways and is running just beside the tree line, almost parallel with him at this point. <laughs> Doesn't know it at the time, Carl tells him later, but he jumps in the sled and Carl takes off and uh, Joe started looking around and by that point, this thing had already cut back off into the woods, so Joe didn't see that aspect. He was filled in on it later. According to what Joe said, that night when they got back to their friend's house where they were staying as their home base for this little, you know, fur collecting adventure, uh, Carl was very somber and, and like deep in thought, right? And Joe was like, hey, this is what I saw. There's something dark moving. And, and Carl just kind of nodded and wasn't saying much. And that's unlike him, it's, uh, you know, from what Joe said, normally Carl's a... Uh, kind of a goofy guy likes to joke around a lot and just say silly stuff on a regular basis so you know him being very somber and quiet Joe could tell something was off with him and he asked him well you when you were pointing before you knocked me out of the sled what did you see and he goes it was big and it was looking right at me and he goes well what what was it was it a moose what you know because obviously middle of winter it couldn't have been a bear and Carl commenced telling him well it looked pitch black, but I could see the glint of the light and the snow in its eyes. I could tell it was a living being. Uh, the eyes, all I could see was the glint. I couldn't see any color. Uh, it was at such a distance. It was silhouetted in trees. I really couldn't make it out, but it was looking right at me, and that's what freaked me out. So Joe accepted it. And they're reevaluating their fur trapping adventure, right? And so after they talked they said let's sleep on it let's make a determination the next morning on whether we're just going to hang it up and just call it good we don't know what the hell's going on so come the next morning they're eating breakfast and carl's like we need to forget about trapping today take the snow machine and sled let's bring some provisions let's go find out what this is maybe it's it's other trappers and that's why we're not getting our furs maybe they're basically hijacking our furs unbeknownst to us and we're coming back and checking empty traps because they had already gotten to them you know joe's like well that mm, that doesn't make sense that's a lot of effort we had to see their tracks and you know carl's like no if they took a spruce bow and swept the snow and and so joe's like, all right we'll, we'll go check it out so according to what joe said that next morning uh carl was real apprehensive Carl didn't want to be the one driving the snow machine. He wanted to be with a high caliber rifle in the sled. 
he did not want his hands occupied by the handlebars of the snow machine. Joe's like, okay, no, no big deal. Well, um, they take off and they're going along and this is just before light. So you got to understand middle of the winter, it, it, it doesn't necessarily get daylight like you think. There's ambient light and snow. And so, gosh, I'll have to get you guys some, some visuals on that when, when I can. So it's kind of hard to explain. So you got all the white snow reflecting the ambient light. So it, you can see tree lines. You can see, you know, the trail in front of you quasi. Um, it's not pitch black, right? That's all I'm getting at. It's just not pitch black, but it's, it's not super bright out either. Anyway, it, it's hard to explain. So anyway, they're going along in these conditions and, and their plan was is to go the back way around their trail that they normally do and get back up towards the end of that, that valley there and check out what was going on, go look for tracks, go look for the way these, they, they had it chalked up to other trappers raiding their, their traps. So they wanted to find their way in and out and how they were, you know, they were feeling robbed at the point. So once they got back over there, uh, he killed the snow machine, they had their plan, they turn on their headlamps and they start looking for these access ways that these rogue trappers were coming for their stuff, right? And so as they are breaking trail with snowshoes and backpacks on, uh, Carl's got a high power rifle, Joe just has that little 1022, 22 long rifle, and his little snub nose 44. And they're, they're trudging through the snow heading towards this tree line. Now, from what he said, uh, the, the, the top of their teardrop is actually a small, short valley, and the other two valleys continued, you know, going uh, basically north and south. So at the top of that teardrop, they decided they're gonna check this other little valley out and see if they could find any trail coming in or out. Because it had been a few days since there was snow, uh, there should be obvious signs of tracks. And so they head in there and uh, just as they were going along, they were about, he said, about 50 feet away from where they could see disturbances in the snow. Uh, it's real easy at, at night. If you got a bright light and you, you know, you're shining across the snow, you could tell if there's footprints in it, right? And he said, we noticed these tracks at a distance and we figured, aha, there, there's the trackway. So as they cleared half that distance, 25 feet is all they got and they were screamed at the scream he said sounded like it may be 75 yards away but he's really guesstimating and he said it was so loud that it was very uncomfortable uh he said they were shook immediately uh carl was in the lead or quasi in the lead they're kind of offset from each other but he was still in the lead and the first thing carl did was start yelling we're here we're here we're you know yada 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 we're trappers over here you know quit stealing from us it, not knowing what the hell was really going on he was just giving something back to the scream it was like a nervous energy response from what joe said so they immediately start backing away because they hear this deep guttural growl going on at the same time and they're like oh shit you know what you know what is this kind of deal so as they're backing away uh joe had fully turned around and was trying to beat feet back to their pack trail and they had a little ways to go to get there and Carl was walking backwards now remember they got on snowshoes so that's not an easy task so Carl is walking real wonky trying to back step and it's moving real slow but he can't stop looking that direction Joe gets a little distance from him turns around and just with this headlamp uh, he said it was mm, probably a hundred yards and it was beyond the viability of his little headlamp but there was enough light where he saw the glint of eye shine and it was red eye shine in the tree line and he's like carl over there over there and carl had a brighter light uh attached to this high power rifle and beams over that way now when i say attached it's not like a picatinny rail combat sight type of deal no no he had a little contraption with an old school mag light with the four battery deal on the bottom of this high power rifle. It was it's nothing high tech. He just had a better light and clicked it that direction and these this eye shine lit up. Well, they were immediately 
<clears throat> taken aback because they saw the initial eye shine real big, real bright, and back behind, off in the distance, they saw a single eye shine kind of doing this number from behind a tree. They turn around, that's all they needed, uh, and they, they, they backed out of there, right? So when they got back to the snow machine, they were sitting there talking about what they saw. It, not that far of a distance. They could clearly see where they just were when they were eye shining this thing just out of view, right? It would be just kind of quasi around the corner off to their right. They're sitting there talking and they're like, that that's not a that's not a rogue trapper stealing our shit. We we're done trapping. So they start, well, okay, we got X, Y, and Z invested in all these traps. We'll we'll just go back, wait a couple days and come clear our gear out, right? And so as they're talking, they'd realize we should probably go because they started hearing weird noises. They it sounded like something was moving in on them, but they couldn't really tell because of the hush of the snow, and it was just real eerie, so they just jumped in and called it a day. Three to four days later, um, as as they got their courage back up, because they're still shook from the screams and the weird eye shine, and they still hadn't had a, a full-on sighting. They saw figures, but it was all, you know how people, they just want to dismiss it in their own mind, so that's what they chalked it up to. So. As they go back out, they are uh, hyper paranoid. So Carl stood guard with the high powered rifle while Joe would run over, undo the trap, unwrap it, do you know, do what he had to do, throw throw the trap in the sled, and they go to the next one. So they had a count and they had little flags on each of the trees. They had all these little Martin sets and other sets, you know, uh, for Lynx, Wolverine, whatever. And they were going through methodically doing their th doing their thing, and they got about to the halfway point. And uh, in the winter time up here, you don't have an extended amount of daylight, um, especially middle of the winter. You know, you're dealing with three to four hours, and up in the interior, maybe a little less than that, uh, roughly give or take, of actual daylight. The rest is like dusk or pitch black, unless you know the ambient light. There's you know reflecting off the snow, but nowhere you want to be. So they get about to the halfway point. And Joe said when they were at that halfway point, uh, Carl was smoking a cigarette and was just sitting there, you know, kind of looking around because it was quiet. They were calmed down. Well, they there was a short distance. Uh, they had a Martin set and then they had like a Lynx or a Wolverine set about 50 feet away from that one, right? So Joe was going over to check the set and they had a Wolverine in it, right? but it had just been buried by snow and stuff so they he dug it out he was doing his thing he had to come back over and grab a small little hatchet to break it free and uh as he was transferring it back over to drop it in the sled with the traps uh they hear that low growl but it was off at a distance and they're like okay where'd that come from well it just so happened at that top of that teardrop they're in a little i wouldn't say box canyon but a little tight valley real small uh it was coming from somewhere, but it was at such a low uh, tone, they couldn't pinpoint exactly where. So now their heads are on a swivel. Uh, Joe's got his glove off, he's got his 44 out. Carl's got his, you know, the rifle ready. They're looking around. And he said this thing was, wasn't worried about them at all. He said it did not fear their guns. It did not fear them. This thing was about 25 feet away, just in front of them and the direction they were heading. Uh, about 25 feet in front of them and about 15 feet up on the hill it stood up and they didn't notice it but it blended in seamlessly it stood up and walked looking right at them as it as it crossed the path and went up on the other side growled again and then walked away they were in total shock at that moment they said screw the traps screw all the investment on that shit, whatever we're done fired up the snow machine Joe jumped in with the they had one Wolverine and uh, he said maybe 20 over other furs you know at the end of the whole ordeal um, and they got out of there now when Joe talked to his buddy the snowbird uh, later on down the line let him know hey thanks for letting us stay there we're no longer there you know uh, I took care of the electric bill or whatever 
thanks again uh, his friend asked him well man the season's still going you guys are still good till like march or april or something like that aren't you and he's like no no we're, we're we're done right now and guy was like well what happened was it just a bust and and joe for the life of him couldn't couldn't tell him what they dealt with and just said yeah it was a bust well his friend a couple months later uh actually about six months later he said uh got a hold of him and was like hey uh because he had just gotten back up from his little snowbird trip he tells him hey what what happened what really happened uh with you guys out there because i've been curious and i've heard things from people around and whatnot what'd you guys deal with and so he tells him what i just shared with you guys and his friend told him that our old neighbor used to warn me about those things back in there and i never believed him i thought he was a kook but because he's known joe for so long and trusted him so much everything came together for his buddy who had heard the stories but joe didn't hear any of that either did carl they had to you know piece things together after the fact but uh, I want to thank them for sharing. Thankfully, you know, nothing happened with them. It was just, Joe said the way it stood up and walked and then walked away from him, it seemed like a territorial thing. Um, he he said there was no mind speak, but he got the impression that they just weren't welcome there. Um, and, hey, you, you got to go with your intuition, right? Because uh, if you don't out here, uh, you know, you're, you're a goner. And again... Uh, Joe and Carl are, are not fresh to Alaska. They were fresh to trapping. That's the only, they're, they're, they weren't weekend warriors. These are hardy Alaskan dudes. They just never dealt with anything like that. Um, I want to thank Joe for the effort uh, staying in touch with me so we can, you know, get the chronological order of things down. Um, this happened approximately 30 years ago. Uh, his good friend Carl was killed in an auto accident about 10 years ago, somewhere down in the States, uh, RIP Carl. So anyway, I wanna thank Joe for sharing that. Um, he got a little emotional and I don't blame him, you know, speaking about his lost friend. Um, been there, done that. But uh, thank you, Joe. Uh, thank you guys for joining me. And we will, uh, let me see, am I forgetting something? I don't think I'm forgetting anything. Anyway, if I remember, I'll save it for the next video. Anyway, thanks for joining me today.